This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. It's my pleasure to welcome Jeff Booth. He is the founder and former CEO of Build Direct, a technology company that aimed to simplify the building industry. Uh, he's founding partner of Odeo Labs, co-founder of Abbey Invest and Knock Knock, and he's also the best-selling author of The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future. Jeff, welcome. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me, Jason. And you're coming to us from one of my favorite cities, Vancouver, Canada, right? It's pretty beautiful, yes. Yeah, yeah it is. It's a, it's a great place. So I have long talked to my listeners, Jeff, about how there's sort of this war of opposing forces, if you will. On one side, there's technology and globalization, both very much deflationary. And on the other side, there is irresponsible monetary and fiscal policy inflationary. <laughs> and which one will win, we don't know yet, because the outcome has yet to be known to us. But deflation does make life more abundant. And, you know, if I look around in my own life, I constantly think about it. And I think, wow, just everything I buy is so much less expensive than it used to be. And like The Economist, they use hedonic adjustments, hedonically adjusted. It's better and it's even cheaper if you hedonically adjust. With the exception of assets, real estate, much more expensive, and you get a lot less, a lot less land with your house, etc. So it's hard to really kind of figure this out, isn't it? But tell us about deflation being the key to an abundant future. There is no doubt. There's nothing that governments can do long term to stop deflation. Nothing. Um, deflation will win. Short of destroying, can, can they just print so much money that no matter how good technology is and how much Moore's law, the power of the processor, you know, doubling every eighteen months, no matter how deflationary that is, can they just be so irresponsible and print Zimbabwe level money and and prevent deflation? Is it impossible? Uh, for them? So, so that's on the way to deflation on the other side of that, mm -hmm. right? But but in the end, fighting deflation is like fighting gravity. Mm -hmm. You would not, you're, there's, you're going to waste a whole bunch of money um, and you're not going to, you're not going to stop it in the end. You said it perfectly that you have an opposing force. If you look at the CPI and the things that are inflating, um, healthcare, education, Tuition, yeah. education, um, the house prices and everything else, all of those are inflating unnaturally because they're, they have so much money chasing them. When you have zero rate interest rate policies and, and essentially you're punishing saving, you're creating an incentive structure to not save. And you're creating an incentive structure on opposing to create more debt. And that, and that debt creation, $185 trillion of debt creation in the last 20 years to try to grow out of a deflationary environment, it actually adds to disinflation. Because if you assume you have to pay back the, the debt at some point, the consumer the spending has to go down. You juice growth in the short term at the, at the expense of growth in the long term. So that $185 trillion of printing to, or, or debt creation did boost economies, but it was like pushing on a string. It's actually only increased GDP globally by $46 trillion with all of that printing. So you can see structurally you have a, have a break. So it takes more and more debt to chase less and less growth. And then we're at a point where it not just takes, it doesn't just take debt, it takes bailouts and, and complete butchering of any sort of capitalist capital system and free markets that, that we grew up with. So it's really easy to see what's, ha what's going to come. Okay, so butchering of capitalism, which, by the way, I agree with, and the pre-coronavirus, we could argue that capitalism and free markets had a chance. Now, I think we are firmly in an era of socialism, MMT, modern monetary theory, maybe, Orwellian 1984, 
who knows? I mean, you know, the Austrians, you're just out of luck, folks. So the Austrian economists, the Austrian school, it's just not happening. What do you mean when you say that? You say it's now, but in 2008, we had, so my business in 2008, uh, banks on the other side of the ocean wouldn't accept LC's letter of credits because they didn't trust the counterparty risk. Um, and so the global economy effectively stopped as, as people didn't trust balance sheets of different uh, counterparties. And bailing out that system, was, which really was socialism for the rich, um, kept some our asset prices artificially high and reduced the value of cash in doing so and set us on to, essentially, you pay, we papered over 2008. That created more divide of society as if you were an owner of assets or stocks, the stock prices went up when they should have gone down if you didn't let that happen, if you actually let capitalism clear the market. They should have gone down. We should have entered a depression. It would have been ugly. But, but it would have been quick. It would have been quick, and right. people with cash would be the new leaders. Instead, you destroyed the value of cash, and you incented uh, you sent incented asset holding, and you actually took down the value of savings more. Is it any wonder in a system that works like that that companies would not save money for rainy day because if you're making the money worthless and you're going to bail out the system over and over again, then being in cash is the worst thing you can do. So you set up your own demise because of kind of a perverse incentive system that values debt and, and asset prices higher to try to get good growth in a deflationary environment. So when you say you, you mean the government and the central banks? All, all over the world. Yeah, all over the world. Governments and central banks all over the world. Yeah, got it. Okay. Yes, they definitely distort the market. They don't allow one of the most important things markets do, which is known as price discovery. And so they keep kicking the can down the road effectively, right? Because they never want to have pain on their watch. And so they try to just minimize the pain, but that has its own consequences, of course. But let's go into the technology angle. And well, actually, maybe before you do that, one of the sub chapters in your book is entitled the Ponzi economy. And I would love it if you would elaborate on that for us. Well, it's connected to what we just talked yeah. about, the amount of debt created. And at some point, people realize that debt can't be paid back and you reset and everything's reset. Now, that's reset through bankruptcies and depression, or it's reset through essentially debasing currencies and creating hyperinflation, or it's reset through revolution. But once you pass that, once people realize the debt can't be paid back, it can go on for some time like that while people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. As soon as people realize that the debt can't be paid back, it starts to turn into a Ponzi scheme. The last one in, if the last one in um, to that gets really hurt. And so connecting the dots to all of these things, if you just start with kind of first principles on inflation or deflation, they're not good or bad. They just have different winners and losers. Right. Uh, deflation makes your value of money go up because goods and services go down in relation to, to your money. That's, I don't see how that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, inflation is the opposite. It makes your assets worth more because uh, because your money is worth less. Now, if governments to say, said instead of we have inflation targets of 2%, if they said we want to destroy your currency at whatever cost, you might have people up in arms. But if you drive inflation into that deflationary environment where it wants to go, asset prices explode in value. That's what happens. And so that's what you're seeing. And the owners of those assets become the winners. Because they own hard assets that have intrinsic value. Is that your point? It's not, it's not just hard assets. The stock market right now has no bearing to reality whatsoever. Right. Right. Prices go up in something. So if you have stocks and everything else, they're uh, it kind of shares of companies that people deem valuable. There's a race to to hold things that are going to go up because of the stimulus. You know, it's kind of interesting when we look at the macro of the inflation deflation picture, in a way you could almost argue that deflation causes inflation. And here's what I mean by that. You know, when all of your consumer products are so inexpensive as they have been getting, I mean, certainly everything's cheaper and better than it used to be. Then you have these other asset items where you have consumer deflation and asset inflation, they get more expensive because people have more disposable money 
with which to invest. The market starts getting flooded with money. It pushes stock prices up, pushes real estate prices up. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting from that perspective in a way, too. And if you think about if you let natural price discovery happen, what would it like to look at it, the acceleration of COVID on Zoom, right? So the company went from 10 million users to 300 million users in, in a month and a half. I suspect that when this is over, 300 million users isn't going back to 10 million users. Right. But it's not going to stay at 300, but it might be at 150 million. Right. And every one of those incremental users is less, less commercial real estate. Oh, yeah. Commercial real estate is there. I mean, the retail apocalypse has been going on for years, but now it's the hotel apocalypse, the office space apocalypse, and who, who and knows you, what else. And you could artificially bail out those industries and keep prices high. Right. And then what you'd have to do with, in addition to that, is you, for all of the people left out of society, that you, uh, because you enriched the people with those assets, you'd have to pay them more to uh, in, so that it could pay rents on those assets. So the amount of uh, wasted money going into something is effectively trying to fight gravity. It is going to break systems. Mm-hmm. It's, going to, it's going to break currencies. So why are governments and central banks so afraid of deflation? If you say that technology is deflationary, which I agree with, and so is globalization, why fight it? Why, like, what's the problem? Why, why are they fighting it? Okay, so first let's go with how deflationary, right? Because it's actually just starting. So if you look at your phone, your smartphone, yep. that was only invented 13 years ago. Right. right? My first phone cost me twelve hundred dollars. Yeah. Hey, hey, I got a better story than you've got. My first <laughs> phone cost me thirty two hundred dollars. It weighed fourteen pounds, and it mostly stayed in the car. But you could take it out and yeah. have like this big, huge lunchbox. Yeah. And it only made phone calls. Right. right. Yeah. And that's all it did. Yeah. And, and now, and, now the, the, and the phone bill was forty five dollars a month base plus forty five cents a minute. There were no yeah. calling programs. Yeah. You know, my, my phone bills used to be $800 a month and mm-hmm. adjusted for inflation today, that'd probably be, I don't know, $2,500. Yeah. My first phone bill was $2,000 yeah. uh, in the first month and then all of it is made phone calls. Yeah. Now, everything on my, the, you look at your app screen and it's all free. Yeah. Um, so the power you have, we think that it's isolated just to small pockets of our industry right now. But with AI, what's coming in technology, and I'm on boards with lots of companies that are developing this technology. With AI, where artificial intelligence is going and what's what's happening across the landscape, we're in the first innings of technology deflation. That across every that abundance, so lower cost abundance is is moving everywhere. And there's a mistake in, that people make, and they think economics is about value. It is not about value; it's about scarcity. And things that are abundant are hard to price. Yeah, I, I always say it's about scarcity and utility. Those are the two. It's not just scarcity. It's also got to have utility. Go yeah, ahead. but let's use air as an example. The yeah. oxygen you breathe. It's right. the most valuable thing to you. Right. Yeah, breathe. The only place you can charge for air is underwater. Mm-hmm. So what technology is doing across all of these industries is it's taking down. So it's taking up abundance and ta- taking down that cost. Yes, that comes at the expense of jobs. So governments are trying to protect jobs by, by fighting a system and having more, more jobs, but they're actually making that whole system more vulnerable by do, doing so, by adding debt and trying to grow their way out of it. To answer your other question, why is it so deflation so bad? Because if you have debt and you allow deflation, the, the debt the, gets more expensive to repay. The debt, yeah. exactly, the debt can't be repaid. So you have a you have a structural change in society with central banks and governments not realizing it early enough and having a problem so big that they don't know what to do with. And so the problem keeps getting bigger at every step, and, and that's what you have. But it, why there's business analogs all over the place for this. It's the same as Blockbuster, 9,000 stores, not seeing technology and how fast Netflix emerges because now download speeds could increase. And the business changes overnight, and, and Blockbuster's 9,000 stores become a, a noose around their neck. And they think by adding candy aisles and popcorn to their stores, they can change that. That is a really good analog to what's happening today in, with central banks and governments trying to delay the inevitable. See, that's the thing. I always say, don't bet against the Fed. As much as I philosophically hate what the Fed and governments, well, not just the Fed, but every central bank is doing, you know, because I think it ought to money, the, the value of money ought to be dictated by a free market. But it doesn't matter what I think. 
What matters is that they are the two most powerful entities, governments and central banks, the human race has ever known. And by betting on deflation, you're betting against them because not only is every individual's debt and every company's debt more expensive to repay in a deflationary environment, but also the national debt. And hey, if we want to wipe out our debt to China and Japan and everybody else, then all we got to do is keep inflating and, you know, we just pay it back in cheaper dollars. So it's a pretty good business plan for them. But you're saying technology is so powerful that it can't overcome massive amounts of money creation, right? So, so let's say you did that, right? And so so the, uh, just was it yesterday, there was talk about not repaying China or, or letting local bankruptcies in the bond market collapse about uh, cities in the U.S. What do you think that does to world trade and, debt and the debt markets? It explodes, right? Everything changes in an instant. So things that seem like they never change, um, change in an instant at some point. What happened last week in oil was a, a two weeks in oil, in oil is a really good example. And I'm sure if you ask most people, they'd say, put your money in oil because you can never lose. A negative $37 oil future yeah, I know. Is where you get paid to, again, because it's abundant, because there's no place to store it anymore and it becomes nobody wants it. And so there is going to be a time when people in, in the bond markets, I think actually probably right now are still good because the because the dollar is going to get stronger and interest rates are going to go negative. And the dollar is still going to get stronger in spite of that because the U.S. has a reserve currency and other countries are failing faster and, and needing those dollars desperately, which is creating demand for U.S. dollars. But at some point, that's going to, that's going to break. Why? And, Why does it break? It breaks because either U.S. can't pay back the, the debt, it drives into hyperinflation and changes the, let's say you and I trade together, and I'm in Canada and you're in the U.S., and I borrow a whole bunch of money from you, and then I decide to pay you back in booth dollars with a different denomination. Will you trade with me again, or will you not want something more secure? Well, here's the deal. I may not want to trade with you, but I may not have a choice for two reasons. Number one... You may be my biggest customer with the biggest economy. And the next part of that is, number two, you also have the biggest military the human race has ever known, and you're going to force me to trade with you, essentially. I suspect on this that both those answers that don't solve that dilemma. You'll find if you're going to trade with somebody because they're a big buyer, but they never pay their bills, Mm -hmm. it seems seems like a greater fool of philosophy. Well, I mean, you know, the U.S., if we're doing the U.S.-China metaphor, right, which I think we are, maybe we're not, but it seems like we are, then, you know, the U.S. pays, gets the goods from China, pays it back in cheaper dollars, and that's a pretty great deal for the U.S. I don't know why Trump is complaining so much about, I get that the trade war, too, you know, that's sort of a... separate kind of issue in a way. But as far as the inflation issue of, you know, buying goods, paying them back in cheaper dollars, that's a pretty great deal for the U.S. It is, but it's the same deal for China. It's actually a good deal for China, too, because what China does is they devalue the currency, so they have cheaper labor to, uh, to play that game. And then the trade wars start because, because wait, they're stealing our jobs because they have cheaper labor because they're, they're artificially changing the currency. And as they change the currency value, everybody that everybody knows they have to de- they have to devalue the currency. Money floods out of China into real estate in, in the U.S., further exasperating the problem. So you have when you don't have a base of currency tied to something, and every government is printing their own currency, be it currencies, you have you have manipulation of pricing everywhere. Sure, you do. I mean, I agree. I'm just saying that. The reality is, I, I don't know if that game ends very easily. It seems like they can kick that can down the road for a long time. I don't like it. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying it is, you know. They might be able to. That's what I'm getting at. But the cost of kicking that, that can down the road means asset. Price. So today, what would you do? Let's play out both scenarios, right? In one scenario, that's going to happen. And I would say that's a high probability scenario. So Fed is going to, at whatever cost, bail out markets, and they're going to keep going. That means that in the short term, asset prices explode. Real estate explodes higher, everything else. Everybody searches for safe haven of assets. Gold explodes higher, everything else to be able to protect against that happening. Step two of that, taxes have to go up significantly to pay back that debt, assuming it's going to pretend to be paid back. (laughs) 
Step three of that is when that can, and that slows economies and we get here again. And step four of that is debase your uh, currency. So that's the path on that. And it won't stop def- technology deflation in the end anyways, because technology is marching forward. Or that doesn't happen on that. And companies go through, or countries go through kind of an orderly unwind. <laughs> and it looks more like a managed, I, de- I, I hate to say this, but it looks more like a managed depression. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, and you rebound stronger on the other side. The thing is, as much as we might criticize the U.S. for the way they're handling it, it's pretty much the game plan of almost every developed country. I mean, you think our debt's bad? Look at Japan. You know, they've got 230% to GDP debt. You know, ours is only like 100%. I mean, we're, we're really good, and they don't have the reserve currency or the biggest military or anything or the biggest economy. So, and Japan has a Japan's just not going to exist in 70 years. I mean, they can't if they don't have immigration or children. You know, if you don't have any people, you can't have a country. I don't know. It's just a very weird situation. If you have a comment on that, go ahead. But I want to ask you in uh, chapter four of your book, I love talking about self-driving cars. But before that, you talk about doubling up. And I'm curious what you mean by that. So technology, and, and it's more than Moore's law, or Moore's law, but let's use Moore's law as a case of exponential growth. Right. And so whether it moves from Moore's Law to quantum computers or to whatever, but let's see, Moore's Law doubles every 18 months to two years. Right. And to see that effect, the same effect that's in your cell phone is to project it forward is that type of doubling up. I think it tricks most people can understand the, the pace of change. And so if you fold a piece of paper on itself, if you could fold, you can only fold it on itself seven times. But if you could continue folding to 50 times, that piece of paper would reach from here to the sun. And I've asked that question to tens of thousands of people and audiences all over the world. Most people guess about two inches. And so what that tells you is not a whole bunch of people. We misunderstand exponential technology, exponential patterns. If you compare that analog of paper folding to the sun to what's happening with technology, we are on fold 33 right now. In 18 months, the, the technology that we see will... So we're looking backwards, and all the deflation that we've seen and all the money printing to be able to stop it is looking backwards in the rearview mirror. Looking forward, what's ha- what's going to come across society is so staggering that people aren't prepared for it. And there's nothing governments can do to stop it because it's marching forward, and it's it's AI is moving at light speed across industry. Uh, self-driving cars, additive manufacturing, name an industry that isn't going to see yeah no, it's, it's truly amazing i mean it really does feel like we are at a hockey stick inflection point in the world of technology but i try to think back to the past and you know i'm i'm a pretty decent history student maybe they thought the same thing when the steam engine and the sewing machine was invented and you know every other innovation you know everybody thought there's going to be unemployment and and by the way those things you just mentioned are unemployment <laughs> promoters to say certainly the self driving car maybe the most of any of them so i don't know stick with what you you just said and the first time when you fold a piece of paper once or twice mm-hmm. there's no way you can predict that'll go to the sun right? no three times four times there's no way you'd make that prediction the same thing happens with technology. In the early predictions, there's a whole bunch of people saying what this is going to do, and then it folds once, and it, and it disappoints, and it creates nothing. Right? It look as there's no change, and that change compounds on itself and compounds on itself and compounds on itself. We are so now. If you take that that analog, so they said the same thing against electricity, or they said the same thing against. But electricity was a general purpose technology that as it rolled into society, it did create deflation. And there were a whole bunch of wars as governments to, uh, to, to be able to try to... Hey, I think, I think it was Buckminster Fuller who said, yeah, electricity will eventually get so cheap, they'll just give it away, it'll just be free. But that didn't happen. And but by the way, maybe that still happens, right? Maybe, maybe. He, maybe he was just early. Yeah, maybe. Uh, electricity is a bad analog for artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is moving exponentially. Mm-hmm. And nobody ever thought electricity would be smarter than humans, which most of the top AI researchers believe is we're on a path to be able to get there. So every job is a function of our intelligence, which it clearly is. And artificial intelligence has the possibility to to be smarter than us. 
it's hard to see how logically there's way more jobs out of that type of technology. I agree. I think unemployment is definitely a big concern. And I think that might be the the need for universal basic income. And amazingly, even some of my most Austrian school libertarian friends believe that we are headed quickly toward UBI. Andrew Yang was on my show before I interviewed him, the presidential candidate who's behind the, the universal basic income concept. And it may be coming, may be upon us, you know, for sure. What about the laws of energy? I mean, right now we're in this oil glut market, but that's kind of a weird anomaly probably. But but energy just in general, we were talking about electricity. And for any of this stuff, you got to have energy. Anything on that? There's a whole chapter on it. And kind of, and I think we're still some ways off. There's still, but solar is now competing for lowest cost energy. And, and that's, we're a long ways off solar contributing to all our energy needs. But the path of the reduction, if you looked at the trend on solar cost, what it is today, and project that forward, energy is going to be deflationary as well for economies. And when economies are built with 10% of of all economic output is in energy, and if you have an incentive to have cheap energy, your economy does better. It's what drives coal, natural gas, oil, a military machine to protect cheap energy. If you, and you could argue this, if you have solar that is getting to be the cheapest energy, and that continues on a downward trend like it seems to be continuing, that changes economic paradigm across countless industries. Yeah, it really does. We will see where it goes. Jeff, give out your website and wrap it up with a closing thought. If that wasn't your closing thought, yeah, sure. <laughs> maybe the, it was. Uh, yeah. yeah, you can follow me at Jeff Booth on uh, on Twitter. Uh, the website's JeffreyBooth dot com. And it's been great talking with you, Jason. Thanks. Good talking with you too, and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.